Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Journal Club. Today we will discuss the consensus paper from APCI ACVC for percutaneous ventricular assist devices. Today's presenter is Mario Gramegna from San Raffaele Hospital in Milan. And as expert, we are pleased to have chairperson of the document, Dr. Alai De Chieffo from the same institution. Enjoy the discussion and looking forward for your comments. Thank you. This is an important paper because is a uh, simultaneous publication on our intervention and uh, ACVC uh, European Art Journal. Uh, it was published two weeks ago. And uh, as we can see, uh, there is uh, a still uh, increasing incidence of cardiogenic shock in the last years, but the mortality is very, very high. It's over 50%. And uh, as you can see, MCSU seems stable, but on the figure, in the figure on the, on the right, you can see that starting from 2012, there, there was a drop in uh, EABP utilization use because there was a EABP shock trial that destroyed the, the intraortic balloon pump. And there was a, 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 an increase in uh, PVAD and uh, VA ECMO uh, use. This is the only uh, consensus document published uh, in 2015, so it's, also, it's, um, it's, uh, it's old, six years ago, by the Sky Association and um, American College of Cardiology. I want to start with this, uh, with this table published in the paper. And uh, as you can see, there are uh, many, many uh, devices. And uh, every device is different from each other. So it's quite difficult to, to, to choose the right device in the right situation. We have two specific devices uh, for RV support. Uh, one is the Impella RP, and the other one is Tandem Art RV with the Cannula Protect Duo. It's a double lumen uh, cannula placed in the uh, internal jugular vein on the right. And all, the, all this pump, except for interactive balloon pump, are, co are continuous pump. And to the, just the impella device uh, has a, an axial flow. All the other one has a centrifugal uh, flow. For big ventricular support, we know VA ECMO. And for the left support, we have interactive balloon pump. Uh, IVAC 2, two liters is a um, a new device, a new device is a transartic device, but we have no data about that. And the other one is Tandem Art and Impella. Impella, we have 2.5, the CP is 3.7 liters per minute, 5.0 and 5.5. And uh, in the table, you can see there, there, there is a lot of difference between uh, this device, the insertion, the cannula size, the inflow and the outflow, and also the complication associated to these devices. Here you can see where the devices are placed. Impella RP and Protect Duo, uh, are the inflow, the inflow is in the right atrium or in uh, inferior vena cava and the outflow is in the pulmonary artery. Uh, central VA ECMO from the right atrium in the proximal aorta and peripheral ECMO in the caval vein to the aorta. For the left side, the Thundermart is the only one from the left atrium to the aorta, and we have three devices uh, trans, uh, transvalvular aortic. So left impella, IVAC, and Artmate PHP is another one device similar to left impella, but in this case also we don't have any data. Uh, in the paper, we, we show all the indication because as we can see, uh, there are a lot of devices as, and it's difficult to choose the right device. I want to start with the iris PCI. For the iris PCI, uh, is intended one clinical and one angiographic characteristic. For clinical characteristics, we have left, left ventricle ejection fraction uh, under uh, low to 35%, hemodynamic instability, diabetes, acute coronary syndrome, previous cardiac surgery, and cord uh, chronic uh, kidney disease. For the angiographic, we have diffuse CAD, multivessel disease, unprotected left main, severe coronary total occlusion, rotational aterectomy, and last pathet conduit. So when we have one clinical and one angiographic, we can define iris PCI. In this case, intraortic balloon pump should not be used. This is due to the BEACHES-1, the only trial in this field about intraortic balloon pump. For the axillary flow pump, so impella, 
may be considered, but it's really important to uh, assess the, the, uh, the femoral axis. This is due to the protect two. Protect two doesn't uh, didn't show a difference between intraortic balloon pump and uh, um, intra and uh, impella uh, at 30 days. But in 90 days, there was a, a, a strong trend in um, in favor of uh, impella, but many uh, vascular complication. For the ECMO, there is no evidence, so it should not be used. In high risk MI, high risk MI is intended uh, an anterior MI extended with some uh, signs of shock, but not clearly shocks. So tachycardia or, or um, uh, hypotension, relative hypotension. In this case, intra balloon pump is not suggested. This is due to CRISPAMI trial and PAMI2 trial. For uh, Impella CP, we can, we can think about Impella CP when we need an unloading strategy. Currently, we don't have uh, evidence just in dogs, but there is a very important trial, DTU STEMI trial, that is ongoing. For the ECMO, there are no data, uh, and uh, pathophysiologically increase the afterload, so it can be harmful in this situation. It's really important to know this, this, um, this classification is very new from Sky because cardiogenic shock, uh, not all the cardiogenic shock are the same. And as you can see, Sky uh, divided the cardiogenic shock in five stages. A, at risk. So there is just some patient with the risk of, uh, with some specific characteristic, uh, for, for shock, but is not in shock. Beginning, there are uh, tachycardia, hypoperfusion, so relative hypotension, but without hypoperfusion. Classic cardiogenic shock uh, is, 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 uh, is classic cardiogenic shock, but it sometimes can deteriorate. And in this case, the, the, the cardiogenic shock is defined D, and D is the extremis, so uh, car uh, refractory cardiac arrest, uh, or out, out of hospital cardiac arrest. But it's really important to assess the hemodynamic parameters because the, the, the diagnosis is uh, very important and should be very fast. So for the right failure, it's really important to have a right catheter, right pulmonary catheter, because we need central venous pressure um, over 15 millimeters of mercury. PAPI, this is a pulmonary artery pulsatility index, is a uh, uh, under uh, 1.85 and the ratio between radial and wedge pressure uh, more than 0 0.8. For left ventricular failure in cardiogenic shock, we need the blood pressure, as you know, under 90 millimeters of mercury or mean arterial pressure uh, below 60. And one of cardiac index less than 2.2, cardiac power output less than 0 0.6 and LVDP more than uh, 15 millimeters of mercury. So when we have a cardiogenic shock, uh, we know that uh, routine use is not, uh, of YABP is not re recommended. This is due to YABP shock trial, but in a mechanical complication due to an MI or in non-MI uh, related shock, we can use intraortic balloon pump. For Impella, there is just one small randomized study, is the IMPRESS study, IMPRESS trial, but enrolled just for 45 patients. We can think about Impella in stage sky C and D, but it's important to know that there is a bridge to recovery or bridge to LVAD or transplant to use it. And the same is for VA ECMO. But in this case, also in uh, Sky E is, is, uh, should be considered, and in particular in, pa in patient with refractory cardiac arrest. For isolated right shock, uh, intraortic balloon pump is not suggested because it's not specific for, uh, for the right ventricle. So we have percutaneous right side as, as, as seen previously. So in PLRP can be used in isolated uh, right ventricular failure, but in this case, we can use just when we don't have uh, uh, respiratory failure. In this case, we can use Protect Duo. This is a cannula that uh, can, uh, can be connected to an oxygenator, so we can use it in, the, this, in this situation. For VA ECMO, 
we can use in the sky C, D, and D as we've seen previously. But it's really important. The patient should have should have a, a, a way um, bail out for um, for uh, from the the shock. Otherwise, it's futile. For biventricular assist device, of, of course, the VA ECMO. Uh, we sh we should use always the, the the VA ECMO. But sometimes when the patient doesn't have uh, acute respiratory failure, we can think about to uh, Bipella. So Impella RP plus Impella CP or 5.0, 5.5. Sometimes we need a ventricular, left ventricular loading due to the increase after load due to the ECMO. In this case, we can place an Impella with an Ecpella. So when, after we, we implant the Impella, uh, the problem is to how to manage the impella, in particular the winning. It's really hard to win a patient with mechanical support because we don't have data about that. So we propose uh, this, uh, this scheme to try to win uh, the patient. So when the patient is uh, stable on low dose of vasopressor, the lactates are, are good, the pH is over uh, 7.35, the wedge pressure is low, and there is no congestion, no mechanical complication, we can try to reduce the PVAD to half power for four, eight hours, then reassess the patient. If everything is okay, we can reduce to one quarter power for four, eight hours. And if everything is okay, we can remove it. Otherwise, we, we should think about an upgrade uh, of, the, of the MCS. The complication, this is a very important uh, topic in uh, PVAD because every study we, we have about uh, PVAD, in particular uh, randomized trial, the problem is that there is no benefit compared to the intraortic balloon pump, but the main cause is this one, the complication. Because uh, when you put the impella, you need the impella or other MCS, you need to carefully assess the, the access. It's really important uh, uh, how to insert the, the, the device, but also the manage of the device. And as we can see, there are many complications, in particular bleeding and thrombotic related complication. The most frequent is of course, access related complication, but very common are infection and acute kidney injury, sometimes in impella due to the hemolysis. Um, luckily, there are many ongoing trials in this field. I, I want to highlight the, the first two, in particular, STEMI DTU. Uh, this is really important because it's the biggest trial in the MCS, is still is a rolling, is uh, is bigger than the ABB shock trial, is 688 anterior STEMI patient across US centers, but uh, now also European centers uh, are rolling. And uh, divide um, it, it is studying the when to try to find the, a, a paradigm shift from the door to balloon to door to to a load. So they try to place the impella 30 minutes before prior the PCI and compare uh, to standard treatment. And um, and the, the primary outcome is the, the to show the infarct sites at 35 days measured by cardiac MRI. All the others, most of them are uh, trial on, uh, on ECMO because we don't have study in this setting on, on ECMO. So I want to conclude with this slide. So the, with gaps in knowledge and future studies. Of course, we need pathophysiological studies that evaluate the unloading uh, in high-risk myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock because this is the, body, by the basis to, uh, to try to... To, uh, to have more studies, more randomized trial, in particular the TU STEMI trial, because we need, uh, we need a shift, a paradigm shift from the door to balloon, because now the, the mortality in, a in, a, in, a, in acute myocardial infarction is quite low, is, uh, is 5%, five, 5%. Five so there is something more we need to reduce uh, even more the, the mortality and the outcome of the patient. So maybe the door, the shift from door to balloon, door to a load could be in the future uh, the best option. 
And of course, it's really hard to conduct randomized trial in cardiogenic shock. So large prospective national, international registries uh, are really welcome in the real world population. And of course, as, as we've seen, it's not, it's not easy to choose the right uh, MCS. So algorithm and protocols uh, are really needed in this, um, in this field, in particular for the timing of PIVAD. And uh, last but not least, uh, the device related complication, as we've seen, uh, we need to reduce these, these devices complication and it's, it's really important to have protocol and proper education of the physician and the healthcare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. It's a very nice presentation. And this is a very complex field and an evolving field. I think uh, we will have many data coming in the future, very interesting data. At the moment, I would like to ask to Dr. Kieffo for um, young interventionalists who are going to approach to this uh, mechanical circulatory support field, uh, what are your suggestions? What do you think they sh they, their training should be based on? I mean, the first aspect, as Mario was pointing out, is the fact that there is still device-related complication. And one of the device-related complication is due to the access management. So I do think that the first thing, considering now that interventional cardiology, we switched uh, from femoral to radial approach is to start a program knowing how to puncture femoral artery. Because I have to say that uh, this is uh, also the difficult part when you start going into structural programs, uh, because you come from coronary angiogram, uh, simple PCI, and this is by radial. So the first is to uh, get used uh, to how to puncture the femoral artery. Uh, clearly, it's helpful to have, uh, especially initially, guidance, ultrasound guidance, in order to be sure uh, where you puncture the femoral artery. And, uh, or, uh, I mean, this is the main, main thing, I do think, about the access management. And clearly, another important point is to become familiar to uh, preclosure devices. It is quite discussed in cardiogenic shock if you should do that or not. There is a lot of discussion. Honestly, I don't have uh, one answer despite uh, all the work that we have been doing with so many experts with that document. Because uh, the tendency nowadays in cardiogenic shock is not to uh, preclose because they say that the device is in place for uh, days and days, and there is risk of infection. Honestly, I have a big question mark in that. I think that we will evolve somehow to close also that access for, indeed, uh, um, protect PCI and risk PCI, we need to preclose. Uh, uh, we have the data also coming from our input registry, the national registry we did with the GISA, that the, despite the fact this is a large experience and Julia know very well the data, uh, we had uh, uh, a tendency, some signal that when you preclose that access, especially in high risk PCI, uh, clearly this is going to have better outcomes. So this is the first thing. Learn how to puncture femoral artery and learn how to use closure devices. And clearly learn how to understand the complication of that because that's another important point, I do think. And then second uh, indication, but the indication maybe is not from the young interventional cardiology and the man management, we are lucky enough that there are our intensivists. <laughs> that can, I mean, if the device has to be in place, this is their job and we are very happy about that because it's very, very complex and think the management in intensive units there. Thank you. I think that this is really a good chance to get used also to uh, follow this patient in the ICU thereafter because it's a very important part of the mechanical support and also the weaning, as Mario told us, it's a very difficult part of the job. Um, do you have any questions from the audience? Yes, I have some questions. Um, what about uh, um, the timing of implantation, especially in a high the difference between high-risk PCI and cardiogenic shock uh, settings and the importance to follow the patients, especially in the 
cardiogenic shock patient and, uh, and uh, his uh, equilibrium. I am, you know, Julia, the, the answer, because we did the very, you did the very nice analysis again from our registry, the input registry, and clearly it makes a difference. I mean, we cannot think that Impella can sort out our issue later on. You have to prevent, as always in our field. So cardiogenic shock, you should implant as soon as possible. And, uh, and the same in a high-risk PCI, if really you have, uh, because that's another issue, when you have an indication for high-risk PCI, I mean, we do have some criteria regarding what we're called CHIP, but if the patient is really indicated because he has low ejection fraction, he has a complex distal left main, complex CTO, last remaining vessel, you have to implant up front. And I do think that we have uh, some evidence for sure by our, our registry that demonstrated that uh, this, when we did this before, uh, I mean, the primary outcome uh, was, uh, was, uh, was lower. I think it's quite what quite clear it's coming from the literature. So another time, uh, um, the strategy is important when you approach a cheap patient, even if uh, it's an acute uh, patient or a stable patient. And another question. Um, sorry, Julia, we have a yeah. question from the audience. Uh, yes. um, Kayla, she's asking uh, us, and probably um, this is uh, a question that goes for Mario. Uh, in your routine, a practice, do you always go for right, catheter, right heart catheterization in cardiogenic shock patients? In most of the patients with MCS, we, we have right, cather, right pulmonary catheter. Yes, of course, because it's really important, not only for the, the definition of shock, so to identify shock, but it's, I think, even most important in the manage of the, of the MCS. In particular, for the winning of the of the MCS, uh, to to choose the the right dosage of inotropes, uh, to to choose the right dosage of diuretics, so it's uh, really important, particularly for the winning. But this and is at the bedside. See... Just to clarify, not uh, we are not talking about Calab. I mean, despite no, no, no. this one is in the in the ICU, of course. We don't place the catheter usually in the in the cath lab. But when the patient arrives in ICU, we place the, the catheter bedside. Okay, well, so another follow question, which is a very interesting, coming from the audience, is do you think there is a space for MCS implantation at bedside? Do you think that uh, ICU yeah. specialists should be able to perform impella implantation at bedside? And how to do it? I think so, and uh, we usually do it, in particular for intraortic balloon pump. I think in this case, if you don't have particularly tricky access, uh, but you can access it with, uh, with echo, the puncture we do it with echo, you can see the guide in the aorta with uh, TOE or just TT. It's, it's easy to implant uh, intraortic balloon pump bedside. Of course, you need expertise. But uh, we sometimes place also Impella bedside, Impella CP. And uh, in this case, uh, you can place it uh, with the TOE guidance. We, you don't need ANGIO. And uh, we, we have a very good uh, outcome in, the, in this case. Uh, usually the position of the Impella, when we place the Impella bedside with TOE, is, uh, is, is quite good. It's really good because uh, we can assess with the echo from the beginning. So I suggest to use the TOE also in, in the cat lab. It could be very helpful to, to have the impella in the, in the right position. Now, clearly this is coming from our experience in our yeah. hospital where our uh, cardio intensivists are extremely expert. In the general other hospital, which is not Sarafele, I would suggest to do this in Calab, again, for access management. The issue is the access management. And especially if you want to preclose the access, I do think, honestly, you should do it in the Calab. Then you have a specific center like ours. We are a shock center. We have so many, so talented people in intensive unit care, but they are, I think, unique. And I don't know how much this can be reproducible in other reality. In other reality, 
maybe we should uh, indeed uh, just use the collab. Clearly, if it's busy, the collabs, uh, and you yeah. need to do, you have to do. And the other point is the guidance of the TOE. I agree too, because I have to say that as interventional cardiologists at the beginning of this impel experience, and you know, we are quite large center, I would have followed the, the, the classic interventional cardiologist way to do. I mean, you think to be in the apex, but then I learned, I learned that uh, at the echo, the thing is completely different. So we are working on that uh, with Mario, Alessandro, and also our, our ICU. Um, colleagues, uh, um, how to develop uh, some model, uh, trying to reproduce then whatever you have in the TO guidance uh, and, and at the end, of, because that's very complex, honestly. I think it's an issue that is not very well discussed uh, and it's open because uh, we add some device mark positioning and when you have a device mark positioning, uh, this is going to be paid with uh, uh, worse outcome, more hemolysis, and, and so on, and more device-related complications. Okay, um, I think we have space for a last question. Um, so please. Here I am. <laughs> um, uh, one practical question. Is there room yet for 2.5 Impella? And um, what about the single access uh, uh, Impella? Okay, 2.5, honestly, uh, not so much. Uh, I would say only in very small ladies, very small ladies uh, with difficult access, but otherwise, honestly, we, especially with the new Impella, it, it is CP. As you know, also in the, for example, in DD2 trial, it's uh, CP, there is no 2.5. So I think we will uh, see a switch completely from 2.5 to, to CP. I don't know if it will be, in the future anymore in the market. And one access, that's a very good uh, point. I think it's a very good strategy. We don't do this uh, routinely, but it's just by school. But I think this is one of uh, the skills again, uh, that maybe we should learn and we should teach to our young interventional cardiologists because it's the key for tomorrow. Because the other problem is uh, they will not, is, it, is there the possibility that these devices are getting smaller access? And I think in Pella, they are working since years to get it smaller. They're doing some, some works, but I mean, I, I don't think it will never get to be in a radial, <laughs> in radial artery, that's the point, no? There are other technologies working on that, but let's see. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we are Sandra, I just have on one, time. Arif, please. I just have one yeah. final question. It's a follow-up question more and a, and a practical thing. And this is both to Mario and also the interventionists uh, joining us. I know in some centers, in some places, when a patient with uh, myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock comes in, there's a, let's say in some places, people are talking about unloading first. So the first puncture is the femoral vein to establish the right heart dynamics. Then the next thing is to decide straight STEMI PCI or mechanical support. What are your thoughts on, on, on this concept? I believe in this concept. I think it's, uh, it's the future because we, we can reuse uh, more than that the, the mortality in, uh, in acute myocardial infarction. But I think it, the, 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 the studies in, the, in preclinical studies, there are very, very nice um, uh, outcome in this in in the in, in the animals, and I think uh, I have a very a good expectation in the um, in this field. Uh, I I think the impella the unloading pre or the PCI can reduce the infarct size, and so this is really important in the outcome of the patient to reduce the heart failure and uh, the mortality in uh, in STEMI patients. Thank you. Okay. So thank you uh, everyone for participating to this general club. I think we had a very nice discussion about this topic. And um, so as always, see you on the next Friday for an upcoming issue on um, coronary physiology and you, we will keep you updated. Thank you very much.